many people know who Big Smith is? Okay, local band, right? Uh, two groups, of, two, two pairs of cousins who are related to each other. Uh, the Ballou family uh, make up this group. And uh, Mark Ballou, uh, one of the lead singers in Big Smith, was one of the people that put the Max Hunter folk song collection together and actually transferred it, did the digital transfer from uh, a reel-to-reel -reel or in, in some cases cassette tape into digital format to put on the web. So it made him aware of a lot of the songs on there. And what you find is that the Harrison Burnett version of Pretty Polly that you uh, listened to as part of the assignment you did um, is used by Mark Ballou to create the Big Smith version of Pretty Polly. But there are some slight differences that they make to the song, and I want you to hear their version at this time. Polly, Pretty Polly, can you take me in kind? Beside you and tell you my mind. My mind is to marry and never to part. My mind is to marry and never to part. The day that I saw you, it wounded my heart. Oh, Polly, pretty Polly, come and go along with me. Polly, pretty Polly, come and go along with me. Before we get married, some pleasure to see. He led over mountains and valleys so deep. He led her over mountains and valleys so deep. All he mistrust him and then began to weep. Well, he kinds of changes did Big Smith make in the song as you have heard it now from the Max Hunter site? 
In the Big Smith version, they add a motive for why he might want to kill her, and they also add uh, the punishment that he receives at the end. So uh, they, they sort of fill out the story a little bit more and um, add a few details in. And good storytellers tend to do that. Good storytellers hardly ever leave something exactly the way they got it. They embellish it. They, they make it their own by putting their own individual stamp on it. And I think we can hear that in the Big Smith version of this song. Yes? Uh, in one of the verses, he said that uh, this never could be because her past reputation has been troubling me. Well, that's not made clear. No, 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 it's simply that is his interpretation of why he's doing it. That, that's, that's what we're given in the Big Smith version. Other, other thoughts about this? Okay. Well, just to, just to, to tie things up then with the Ozarks music, uh, I thought you might enjoy hearing that Big Smith version. Now it's time to continue with... African music, and specifically Agabek Kor. My hope is that you've had a chance to read over this material and listen to the specific examples that are in the text of Agabek Kor. But as we discussed the other day, uh, one of the major elements of the rhythm of this particular style is the pull of the three against two. And the way that works is by looking at the rhythm that the bell is playing, the double bell, which is known as the kangogui in this style. Okay. This is actually an agogo bell, but if you listen to okay, listen to that rhythm that's going on, it sounds as if it's in, uh, it's in six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, which would be reducing it by dividing it by two. That would be the division of the measure by three. However, the other instrument that is crucial in creating this particular rhythm, the ahatse, okay, and uh, it's basically a gourd rattle, is playing along in a completely different rhythm that actually divides the measure by two. And we see a picture of that on the PowerPoint presentations. If you look at the first two instruments that are there, you see the division of the bell and the division of the ahatse, okay, or rattle and hand claps. Okay. Now, I want to try to get a couple of volunteers to come up and reproduce this. Somebody uh, would like to volunteer and, and play? Okay, Ryan, come on up. Anybody else? Well, I can play the other part today, unless somebody else wants to come up and play. Okay, Ariel's going to come and give it a try. Which part do you want to play? Who wants to play what? I'll play the bells. You want to play the bell, okay. Can you uh, practice that rhythm for a second, see, see how it goes? And you're going to do the rattle. So you're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, bum, 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 bum.
when an Agabek core ensemble is playing, they're basically creating that three against two pole that is constantly there underneath everything that's going on. Now, your recording on, the, uh, uh, on track 15 of your CD has three different styles of Agabek car. Did you notice that when you listened to it? You have to listen to the whole thing, and I wish they had banded those individually, but they did not. So you have to listen to the whole track to hear all three styles of Agabek core. One of them is slow Agabek core. The other one is a more, uh, a, a, a less rhythmically defined kind of Agabek core. And then finally we get fast Agabek core. And if you listen to that and listen to how fast the bell's going, it's about twice as fast as we just did it. Okay? If you listen to how fast that bell is going. And that's the one that they're used when, uh, when they're doing their fast Agabek core dance. Quite an amazing thing. Okay, good job. Let's, let's give them a hand. They did a nice performance. Okay. Um, yes, on your CD, if, you, uh, if you've had a chance to listen to track 15 on the CD, you have discovered, first of all, the Anya Agabet Kor Society playing slow Agabet Kor at the beginning. Let me play just a little of that. <laughs> Hear the bell there? Hear how fast it's going? One, two, three, four, five, six, which is about as fast as we played it when we just did that demonstration with Ryan and Ariel. Now, when you get to the end of this particular track and you hear the fast Agabet core dancing, then imagine what it would be like to play playing in the ensemble. You have to move ahead in this track in order to hear all three of them because they eventually fade this out and then they fade in the second part of the track 15 okay we'll talk about that one in a minute but that is a more unmeasured style within the Agabet core system then the third track within track 15. Hear how fast the bell is going? Okay. Try to imagine playing that entire pattern that you see outlined in the full background pattern of the PowerPoint. Try to imagine playing it that fast and accompanying dance. It's an amazing experience, a, a mind-blowing kind of experience if you're a drummer and if you're the dancer. And if you would like to see some wonderful examples of this, you can go to do a Google search on Agabet Core, and you can find some examples on YouTube and on MySpace that uh, several people have posted uh, of fast Agabet Core dancing that is just incredible when you watch it done. Uh, and uh, some of the videos show the dancers only. Some of them pan over to show the drummers as well. And uh, it, it's, it's quite an amazing sight. So I encourage you to take a look at that on your own and, uh, and, and see what it looks like in actual performance. It's an amazing sight. Yes, uh, the question is on, the, uh, on, the, on one of the PowerPoint slides regarding Agabet Core, uh, it shows the two patterns together that we just listened to as a demonstration. And the question is, what division of the meter are we stressing? Okay, does anybody know the answer to that? The answer is 
two different divisions of the meter. We're, we're, we're looking at a triple division and a duple division. In other words, dividing the measure by two and dividing the measure by three, or by six and by four, if you want to look at it that way, uh, in terms of how many divisions there are in these, in these measures. Yes? So what are the stresses? I mean, they only match up, they match up on beats one and beats uh, nine. Right. On the top one that the yeah. bell is playing, uh, the stresses are the quarter note on the top one. In other words, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, the fact is that they are offset syncopation-wise by the eighth notes that are in there in the bell pattern. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, yeah, I want to make sure you understand this because, because the, the pull of the three against two comparing the bell to the rattle or the kongogui to the ahatse instruments in the Agobet Corps Ensemble is crucial to making the whole thing work. Other questions about this? Yes, Chris. Are the, are the bell or the, the meter, or the, the instrument that's playing the three always going to be syncopated, or is it going to be on like the triple beats too? The bell? Oh, yeah. The bell plays exactly what you see here all the time. Yeah, they, they always play, and it is uh, essentially ubiquitous throughout Africa. You hear that bell pattern going on. But Agobet Corps is not something that you find throughout Africa. The bell pattern is very common, but that, this particular interlocking pattern is found uh, uh, primarily with the Awe people of Ghana and Togo, as we are studying in this unit. Good. Other questions? OK. As you go through and look at the full background pattern, then, you find more instruments joining the kaganu, the kidi, the totozi, and the koboto are all instruments that you will see in your books. Uh, and they have little drawings of those instruments in the unit on Agabek Corps in chapter 3. Okay? You'll find little drawings of the names of each of those instruments. Uh, I, I will not expect you to know the names of those instruments for the test. Okay? You don't have to know what the ahatse is, for example, but you do need to know about the three to two relationship between the bell and the rattle. That's the kind of thing I'll expect you to know for the test. I don't want you to go memorizing all the names of those instruments unless you would like to, uh, because uh, it is a fascinating topic. Good? Okay. So. So the, the, this interlocking pattern of drums is what makes the whole thing work. And then the vocals happen over the top of that. And in some cases, vocals happen by themselves. As we heard in the second example on track 15, we have some vocal music unaccompanied. And if you turn ahead in your books to the places where the transcription of the vocal happens in the slow-paced songs. You'll see a transcription of it which is largely pentatonic, as we've discussed earlier in this class. Let's go back and listen to just a bit of that. This is the middle Agobet Corps example on track 15. <laughs> As you listen to this music, some of it sounds pentatonic, but as your text points out, the second scale degree, which if you start on E, would be either F or F sharp, that note is different every time they come to it. And if you look at the transcription, you see that sometimes they transcribe it as an F sharp, sometimes as an F, and what they really mean is something actually a little in between there, a note that does not exist in the Western 12-note division of the octave system. We ran into this once before. Anybody remember what that was? 
the yes the Native American flute versus the synthesizer and we heard that certain notes that the flute was playing were not in the system that the synthesizer was playing and so that it sounded like it was simply out of tune. The fact is that uh, some of those instruments are tuned to scales that are not in the Western system of tuning. And we're going to talk more about that as we get uh, into other cultures that use that exclusively. In this culture, uh, we see what, this one particular note that is in a different place each time. And as we move forward in the course to the next unit on African American music, we are going to look at some notes that are the same way. And there's an interesting kind of parallel to be drawn here because the Awe people of Ghana were some of the people who were originally taken as slaves for the slave trade because they lived right on the coast. And so they come over to America. They, they ultimately influence the birth of jazz and the birth of the blues and the use of what is known as blue notes, which we will study in our next unit. And so the fact that the Awe people have certain notes that are in different places every time and that are sort of in the cracks, if you will, uh, between our Western system of notation uh, is, I think, very important as we compare African music to African American music and look at where, where those connections take place. So keep that in mind as we begin our study in the next unit. A couple other things about Agabekor as we, uh, as we finish up this particular part of the chapter. Uh, first of all, uh, everyone participates in Agabekor in this society. Everyone participates, either as a drummer or as a dancer. And non-participation in the Awe society is tantamount to excommunication from the tribe. Uh, if you don't participate in dancing, you are essentially not part of the community, and uh, you can be essentially ostracized. And one of the penalties for that could be uh, uh, not being uh, given a proper burial place with the rest of the community uh, when you die. So uh, there, there are some, some interesting uh, participation kinds of ramifications here. Yes, question. So what about if someone is like physically unable to, like they were born with a deficiency that creates, so they are not able to participate in one way or another? Oh, good question. Uh, I'll have to research that and find that out. I haven't thought of that before. It's possible that they might uh, be participate as a drummer okay. or as a vocalist if they're unable to dance. Yeah, but, uh, but it's a participatory society, which is, touches on an issue that I've mentioned before. If you compare it to our culture, I, uh, we are becoming more and more a culture uh, of consumers rather than participants. Uh, people who say they like music own iPods, right? They don't necessarily perform. Uh, so uh, you compare cultures, you see some interesting changes there. Yes? Yes. Uh, they are certainly allowed to participate. And, and you see a picture in the book of the author participating as a drummer with the Anya Agavekor Society uh, back in the 70s. And so uh, I, I think that you, if you were visiting, you probably would not be expected to perform, but you would uh, be invited to if you uh, had the ability and had worked with them. Other questions? Okay, now I really want you to study these rhythms for Agabek Kor because uh, in one of our sessions that is coming up, we are going to put together an Agabek Kor ensemble. And we're going to need, as you can see from the PowerPoint, we're going to need six players to make it work. So I'm going to be looking for six people to volunteer to be part of an Agabek Kor ensemble. We just did two of the six a few minutes ago. Uh, we'll be coming back to this and trying to put it all together and do some other African rhythms uh, uh, in, uh, in the same session. So be ready for that.
be ready to jump up and volunteer. I'll be looking for people to do that. As we continue on with our study of Africa, we move on to uh, the Monday people of Mali and a composition called Lambango that you find on your CD track 17. And there are three performers in this track. Mariatu Kuyate is the singer in this example. Kakuta Suso is the kora player. And finally, uh, Seni Jobate is speech and percussion on this recording. Let's listen to just a bit of it. <laughs> So, what is a Kora? Yes. Uh huh. It's a harp, right? And um, and there's a particular type of harp that is being represented here, a spiked bridge harp, which means that there is a that the design of the instrument actually looks like a bridge. I mean, it looks like, it looks like a suspension bridge, and that there's a big spike in the middle that essentially holds up the bridge, holds up the instrument. And if you look at pictures in your text you find that many cases the base of the instrument is created with a gourd just like the gourd that we saw the other day for the water drum except instead of cutting it in half they use the whole thing about this size with the other hemisphere and creating the base for the kora and then the strings the big spike coming up to create the bridge and then all of the strings coming down up over the hand posts that, uh, that goes up to the top. Okay. <clears throat> That's the design of the instrument. Unfortunately, I don't have one to show you, but we can hear the recording of the performance on the CD and imagine what that instrument would look like in, uh, in person. Now, who are these performers? And what do they do? Okay, grio. What's a grio or a jololu? The, the function of a grio in this society is to actually be the historical record keeper. Okay, uh, during the uh, uh, during the early days of these uh, of these instruments, these were the people who transmitted the oral history of their people and kept the history alive through song. And in some cases they would be praising the king for being such a great king, okay? And the, the, the king would wake up in the morning to the griot or the shulolu uh, playing uh, the, the, the kora and singing the king's praises. That was the king's alarm clock. Somebody waking you up, telling you how great you are and playing an instrument. Can you imagine having one of those? Yeah, that's the culture. So it's, a, it's sort of like, if you want to put it in Western terms, a sort of like a courtier, um, a servant of the court, mm -hmm. like a jester. Uh, yeah, a, a jester or a minstrel. Uh, it, it, thinking of it in terms of Western history, there were minstrels or troubadours who went around singing for the court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you've ever uh, 
Anybody seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail here? Yeah. Remember Sir Robin had a troubadour going around behind him singing about how great he was. And then when he ran away from that one fight, the troubadour is singing about how he ran away and he's trying to get him to stop. Remember that? Okay, they, 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 they had a lot of fun with that in that movie. Uh, anybody see the movie Roots? It's been a while. It was, it was, it was on back in the 70s. Okay, where an African-American person decided to go back and find his African roots and ultimately found the tribe and had to listen to this big, long uh, discourse of the tribe's storyteller and historian telling the history of their tribe from the very beginning because you couldn't just fast forward to the middle somewhere. He had to start at the beginning and so he had to listen for several days until he got to the part that concerned his actual ancestor and the disappearance of his ancestor when the slave traders came. So uh, the Grio and Jololu in this culture serve that function. They keep the oral history of the tribe. Okay? That's, their, that's their current function. Questions about this aspect of the culture? Okay, that's Mali. Now, the Dagbangba people of Ghana are the next track on the CD. And these are Lunsi drummers. And this is a hereditary clan. This is where you have to be born into the clan of drummers in order to become a drummer yourself. So Andy, that may be the point that you were thinking about earlier in terms of the hereditary aspect of it. And these also serve as verbal artists, counselors, cultural experts. They play two different drums, the gungong and the lunga. And these are the specific names for the double-headed drums that you see in your text. And there is quite a long, um, uh, there is quite a long biography in your text of Abu Bakari Luna, who is uh, the drummer who is featured here. And it goes into their uh, their their work in some detail. There is a term that comes up in regard to both the kora harp and also the, uh, the, the, lun the, the lunga and the gungong instruments that we're studying here, and that is indigenous. Anybody run across that term? Indigenous. What does that mean? Of that area. Of that area. Okay. What else? Native, Native to that place. Yeah. Uh, it probably means more than that, that it actually originated in that place. This is the place where this instrument was invented. Okay? Uh, and so where the kora is concerned, the spiked bridge harp, is described as an indigenous instrument. And that's very important because as we continue to look at world cultures, we're going to begin to see uh, cultures which have been influenced by other cultures. And so there are instruments that people think are indigenous, but in fact they were brought by another culture, but it's been so long ago that they just don't remember the fact that it was not actually invented there. An example of that is, um, is the harp in Latin America, which is considered by many to be an indigenous instrument, but in fact it was brought by the Spaniards in the 15th century. So uh, it's just been around for so long that people consider it that way. In this case, the kora and these drums in the uh, Dagbamba people are indigenous instruments, and it's important to make that distinction. Now, the music that we're going to look at from this culture is called Nagbiegu, which translates, uh, anybody get the translation of that? Anybody run across that? Ferocious Wild Bull. Yes, Ferocious Wild Bull. And what is this song about? Who is the Ferocious Wild Bull? 
An enemy leader, right. And what happened to the enemy leader? Yes, he got killed. The, 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 the king of the Dogbamba people was able to defeat and probably kill the ferocious wild bull leader of the other tribe. And this song is a celebration of that event. So similar to Agubekor, which was drumming that was basically designed to uh, first get everybody ready for war and then later to celebrate the fact that the tribe had won the war, Nagbiegu is the same sort of celebration of a military victory. Let's listen to just a bit of that. Remember when we had our drums out on our table? Let's do that again. Everybody uh, from about this point on be in group one, and everybody over here be in group two. And, and, and just take, take, get, your, get your tables out, your desks, get your drums out, okay? And we're gonna play the drums again. And remember, we're going to do three against two, so this time, this side of the room, you're going to divide by two, divide the measure by two. You're going to divide the beat by three. Let me say that again. This side of the room is dividing the beat by two. This group dividing by three. So if we go along, you're going one and two and one and two. OK, go ahead and play. A little louder. We need some, we need some volume here. Good. You're going to divide by three. Ready? And one and a two and a three. Keep that going. Right. Good, good, good. You hear the pull of the three against two? And you can actually do it. Everybody try this, OK? Try on your desks or on your, on, on your knees or however you would like to play. See if you can get two going on in one hand and three in the other, like this. Okay? Yeah. Not easy, is it? You have to think in, uh, in, in, in two different ways. It's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. You have to think of two different things at once. So uh, getting that two against three happening is not that easy. Now, go back and listen to the drums at the very beginning of this Nagbiegu piece and see if you don't hear that same two against three pull that we just created here. that? Listen again, because that's a very important element of this piece. Okay. There's the three against two in that drumming pattern there with those, those drummers of Dogbangba. And the, the three division that's happening there, if you look in your text, you find that there are actually words that go with this. 
Nagbiegula to to to. Nagbiegula to to to. This is a transcription that you'll find in your text having to do with the Lunzi drummers. <coughs> Nagbiegula to to to. Nagbiegula to to to. There's actually words that are being communicated here by the drums. You'll remember that we talked about the talking drum in our last session and how uh, the, the drums would represent African speech in some ways. And so that when you heard the drums playing, the actual syllables would come to mind and you would be actually speaking by playing the drums. Here, the, the drums are actually playing the chorus of the song. So this music is actually set up as a verse-chorus kind of structure. The verse is sung by the vocalist. And then the drums are playing the chorus, Nagbiegula to to to, which means what? If you turn to your next page, you see the translation. It is Nagbiegu, that's him. It is Nagbiegu. It is the ferocious wild bull. We defeated him in battle. Okay, that's, that's basically what this, uh, what this chorus is saying as it continues to repeat. So whatever the singer sings is answered by the drums in this case, and the words are simply understood because everybody knows what those mean. In your text, you'll find uh, a, a, a section where they discuss how you learn to play these drums. I'm going to read just briefly this, uh, this paragraph from your text. In, this is part of the biography of Abu Bakari that uh, the author includes in the book, who is the Lunzi drummer. I was with my father for a long time, more than five years. My father was hard. I faced difficulty with my father because of his way of teaching. My father would not beat the drum for you. He would sing, and you had to do the same thing on the luna. If you couldn't do it, he would continue until you got it before adding another. So the father would sing the syllables, and then the son had to re reproduce that with the drum, and that's how he learned to play. So when, he, when, when, when a Lunzi drummer or many African uh, people in this culture hear the drum play, they're going to actually hear the syllables that are being sung, and they're going to understand its meaning, because this is the way they've grown up, learning to play and learning to hear this music. Okay. So, if a piece like this were to appear on the test, or perhaps the last piece that we heard, the Lombongo piece, right, or the Agobekor piece, if some of these pieces were to appear on your test, which African characteristics would you apply to them? Go back to your page on African characteristics that's on the PowerPoint. And let's see which of those we might be able to apply to the three songs that we have heard earlier today. Starting with the Agobek Kor. Okay, so tell me some of the African characteristics. Repetition. Do we have any of that in Agabek Core? Patterns. Absolutely. This pattern gets repeated over and over again. Sure. Okay. Repetition. What else? Pentatonics. We certainly had pentatonics in the transcriptions that we saw of the vocal music from Agabek Core. Right. Yes. Non-Western sense of pitch. Non-Western sense of pitch. It's an excellent example in Agabek Core in that transcription of the, uh, of the vocal music. Mm -hmm. Good? Yes? Call and, response. Call and response. Absolutely. Okay, what else? Polyrhythm. Polyrhythm. Three, specifically three against two. Mm -hmm. So you've got several right there. What else? Any others? Syncopation. Syncopation. Bell. I'm sorry, say that again. I said in the bell or syncopation. Uh, in the bell, certainly, yeah, the bell is a syncopated figure. Uh -huh. What else? Accompanied by body movements. 
Company by body movement. Right, Agabek Corps is music for dance. Absolutely. What else? Well, we just came up with about seven or eight right there. Okay, that's, that's the way to study for the test, by the way. And we'll talk more about the test in our next session. But uh, one of the ways to study for the test here would be to create the same kind of chart that you created for Native American music for African music and see how many of them you can apply to each of these compositions. Moving on to Lambongo for Kora and Singer. What do we have there, Will? Songs and storytelling. Ah, yes, absolutely. Songs associated with storytelling. Mm -hmm. What else? Polyrhythm. Polyrhythm? Uh, oh, wait, the, I'm sorry, I was talking about the non theater. Yeah, yeah. This one's not quite as uh, not quite as clear cut. So if you were if you were studying for the test and you had to get your examples on this one, uh, you might have to, uh, to to dig a little deeper. Probably you're not going to find the three against two polyrhythm kind of thing happening in Lombongo. Yes. Could you not find repetition either? Repetition, I think, is is a real possibility. Let's go back and listen to it again. And and you also mentioned call and response. Yeah. For Lombongo, okay. Let's go back and, and listen to that again, and uh, and see if we can come up with those two. <laughs> Certainly repetition, I think, is, uh, is evident in what the Kora is playing, that same pattern over and over again. Call and response, what do you think? Right, right. You might be able to make a case for the fact that the spoken text is a response to the sung text. And, and there, you might make a case for that. It's not quite as clear cut of a call and response as we see in the next example, for example, where the drums are the response to the vocal text. Yes, Andy? Some solo singing and then a non-Western sense of pitch. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was going to say non-Western sense of pitch. I think non-Western sense of pitch especially is good. In the uh huh. Especially in the Korah, where, uh, where the tuning of it is not particularly Western in its, uh, in its, in its design. And Andy says, uh, some solo singing. Mm -hmm. Certainly. OK. Other thoughts on this one? OK, let's go back to Nagbiegu, ferocious wild bull. Characteristics do we have here? Polyrhythm. Certainly polyrhythm. Three against two. Absolutely. What else? Call and response. Call and response. Clear, clear cut case there. Yes. Syncopation. Syncopation. Uh, certainly in the drummers, uh, there are some syncopated features. Uh huh. What else? Storytelling. Storytelling. Mm hmm. Yep. We're telling the story of this battle, aren't we? Okay, so that's, uh, that's a very clear-cut case. What else? One more? Yes. So even though it's call and response, there's only one person singing. Right. Wouldn't that be considered solo singing? Well, you could certainly give it uh, the solo singing category, I think, even though it's call and response, because in this case, the response is by the drummers and not by the, the, the vocalist. Okay. Good. Okay, so you see what to do here. The same kind of thing we did with the Native American chapter, and that is to take 
the characteristics and apply each of them to each of the songs and that way you will be well prepared I think for the test uh, when you are studying for that test that's coming right up. Okay, uh, that is all for today's session. In tomorrow's session we will finish our discussion of Africa and then we will talk somewhat about the next test and what is going to be on it. We'll see you next time.